Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, the scripture text I'd like to read comes from the book of Acts, and I'm going to be reading Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, and this is what it says. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them, and he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. And on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and guards in front of the doors were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and roused him, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so, and he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when he had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, in the telling... May we hear your voice. In the telling, may we know your power. In the telling, may we come, come to experience your power that it wasn't just a, a long time ago, that the power of the risen Christ is here this day. And Lord, may we know that power, the power that breaks chains. Amen. One of the associate pastors here is a fellow named Jeff Ross, and I've known Jeff for a long time. He and I were in seminary together. We both served churches in LaGrange, Georgia, and we commuted 90 miles one way up to Emory and, uh, in hopes that one of us could stay awake. Hopefully, he'd be the driver on the way from, from LaGrange to Emory. And then through the years, we, we've kept up and uh, we started playing golf. Uh, I started playing. Jeff had been playing for a long, long time, and Jeff is a very good golfer. He started when he was a boy. So he's able to do what very few golfers are able to do. He's able to pull the golf club back and swing and swing hard, and the ball goes long and the ball goes straight. I didn't start playing golf when I was a boy. I started as an adult. So I can't do that. When I pull the golf club back and I swing hard, bad things happen. Ugly things happen. Well, we were several years ago out playing golf, and Jeff pulled back, and he swung, he swung hard, and the ball, it's still going. 
well, I, I thought, well, this is my time. Maybe I've been playing golf long enough, and if, if I can swing harder. And if I go hard, swing harder, maybe it'll just go a little farther. Well, I pulled back, and I swung harder. And the ball, it, it rose from the earth, and then it took that little second rise that, 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 that it, it sometimes does. And then it took an immediate right and started looking for trees and water and things like that. So I, I got my club, and under my breath, I said what, what golfers sometimes say. Not that, something else. I, I said, oh, I need a new club. <laughs> and that's when Jeff, my good friend Jeff Ross said, I think it's the Indian and not the arrow. You know, you get to be friends with someone, and, and they think they can tell you the truth when they want to. It was just cruel, just plain old cruel. I didn't want to hear the truth, but it, it was true. You know, the, the club, that's important. The golfer, that's essential. And that's the way musicians, they love their instruments. And every musician loves a, a beautiful instrument. But the instrument is only important. What's essential is the musician, an artist. When they... they they, they buy brushes that are incredibly expensive. And the minute that they, they buy those brushes, they pull out scissors and they begin to cut them and carve them so they can paint something specific. And as expensive as the brushes are, the brushes are only important. That it's the artist that's essential. This morning I read a story. A story about Peter being imprisoned and an angel came to him. Now, there aren't a lot of stories in the Bible about angels. And I think the reason why is because the angels are only an instrument. And sometimes people get confused what's important with what's essential. This is a story about the power of God. The angel is only an instrument. It's important, but it's only an instrument. That throughout the book of Acts... Maybe more than any other book in the Bible, it talks about the power of the risen Christ working through the early church. And in verse 5, this is what it says. It says, so Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. That's how the power of God is accessed, through prayer. That's how the risen Christ is accessed in, in lives of everyday and ordinary people. And it was not just 2,000 years ago. It's today. It's today as well. That today, the risen Christ still has the power to, to break chains. Today, the power of God is strong enough to, to open doors and to set the prisoner free. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. That he still breaks chains. He still breaks chains. He breaks chains today. And he still breaks the chains of fear. That's the first thing that I want to talk about. Back in the middle of the 1900s, that um, it was discovered th that fluoride was appearing naturally in some of the water in towns and in cities around the United States. And scientists began to discover that those places where the mineral fluoride was appearing that the children's teeth were stronger and that it helped fight cavities. Well, it was Dr. Trendley Dean of the National Institute of Health that came up with the idea. How, how can we measure the amount of fluoride that, that would, would be helpful to children and on into adult life to, to keep their teeth strong? How could we measure that and, and then add that mineral to everyone's water in the United States to help ensure that their children have strong teeth and prevent cavities. So he began to do that. And when he discovered, I, I believe it was one part per million, that that was the right amount, they sent out the word that, that fluoride was going to be introduced into the water. Well, immediately hysteria began to, to catch hold like wildfire. And one town, it was reported that the, the people would, 
would send in letters. They would complain that fluoride discolored the saucepans, that fluoride would, would disrupt their digestive tract. It was reported that fluoride was the cause of cracking their dentures. The only problem was that fluoride hadn't been introduced into their water yet. But that's what fear does. Fear releases just about everything but the truth. And fear, fear holds us prisoner as strongly as anything else. And we live in the day of fear. People are tugging and pointing and pushing fear right in front of all of us. And it's that fear that, that, that so often tries to keep us captive. Back in 1992, the news agency TASS it had a story about a woman named Olga Frankovich that in 1947, Olga Frankovich was questioned by the Soviet security police. She immediately went in hiding, and for 45 years, she hid under a bed. She was found in the western Ukraine, hiding. No one was searching for it. No one had been searching for it for 45 years, but for 45 years, she was hiding under a bed. That's what fear does. Fear. Fear. So often it's, it's what keeps young people from saying no to the crowd. Fear. Too often it's what causes married couples to get caught up in infidelity out of fear no longer being attractive to their spouse. Fear. It's what too often causes older adults to, to give up confidence that they're able to cope. Well, 2 Timothy 1.7, the Apostle Paul says, God has not given us a, a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and discipline. This spirit is the Holy Spirit, the, the spirit of the risen Christ available to you and to me. And he still has the power to break the chains of fear. To open the doors and set the prisoner free from fear. And prayer is the access to do it. Prayer is the access to do it. He breaks the chains of fear. And the second thing that I want to talk about this morning is, is that he also breaks the chains of resentment. Read a story about a fellow who bought a brand new Cadillac. He loved the car, but there was one problem with it. There was a rattle in it, an intermittent rattle. He couldn't figure out where it was that sometimes it would be when he was going slowly around town, other times when he was on the highway. Well, he took it back to the dealer, not one time, but three times. And the third time, the dealer finally said, let us keep the car. I'll put two of my best technicians on it and... We won't stop until we find the rattle. Well, these two technicians rode the Cadillac over railroad tracks. They put it on the highway, and they located the rattle inside a door. They opened up the, the inside of the door, and inside the door was a Coke bottle. And inside the Coke bottle was a note. And the note said, so you finally found me, you rich, blankety-blank but it didn't say blankety-blank. And it also didn't call them a child of God. That here, one of the workers who had helped build that cart was so resentful of anyone who might have the money to buy a Cadillac that he was hoping to rob them of joy. But that's not the way resentment works. Resentment is a, a poison that, that, that the resentful person drinks hoping that it affects someone else. That it was resentment that had, had robbed the worker of a job well done. It had robbed the worker of a sense of accomplishment. And that's what resentment does. The book of Job is 
an incredibly interesting book in, in the Old Testament. It's only 42 chapters long, but 39 of those 42 chapters are, are about the, the trials and the tribulations of, of Job. And during all 39 of those chapters, he has three friends. It's hard to see them as friends. They're Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. That's usually not the names folks go to to name their children biblical names, and that's a good thing. But the, these fr- three friends, all th- 39 of the 42 chapters of the book of Job, they're telling Job how he's wrong, and that's the reason that he's suffering. That he needs to, to change that he needs to repent, that good things, that bad things don't happen to good people, and he's not a good person. So they're just adding salt to his wounds. They're adding insult to his injury. They're adding suffering in the, in the middle of, of, of all his heartache. And then it's in chapter 42 that God steps in, and to the friends, he tells, Job is right, and you are wrong. Job has always been faithful. And it says that the anger, the wrath of God begins to kindle toward these friends. But in chapter 42, verse, verse 10, that, and, and this is Job who has every reason in the world to resent and to be angry at his friends that have been adding insult to his in, injury. 42 verse 10 says, The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. His friends who were in the wrong. His friends who had had been hurting him. That it was when Job prayed for his friends that Job was restored. There may be somebody who's hurt you and hurt you deeply. And who knows, they, they may absolutely be in the wrong. That we're still called to access the power of God, to break those chains of resentment, and to pray for them. And it's in the the praying that the power of the risen Christ is accessed. And the chains are broken, the doors are open, and, and the prisoner, the prisoner to resentment is is set free. The risen Christ had power to to break chains 2,000 years ago, and, and He still has that power today to break the chains of fear, to break the chains of resentment. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, to break the chains of isolation. During the Vietnam War, James Stockdale was held prisoner of war for over seven years. At one point, he, was, he had his arms tied behind his back and his, his feet put in heavy irons. He was, he was drug out of his cell to the center of the courtyard. There in the hot sun, he was held for three days. And if he ever began to, to fall asleep, the North Vietnamese would beat him and then beat him again and then sometimes beat him just because they could beat him. That he was there to, to be set as an example for the, the other prisoners of what happens when you don't cooperate. Well, in the middle of that, that ordeal, James Stockdale heard a snapping sound. It was the snapping of, of towels. And that there were long and short snaps. He began to recognize it as Morse code. A code that the, that the other prisoners were sending to him. Again and again and again, they would snap out the letters in code. G-B-U-J-S. G-B-U-J-S. God bless you, Jim Stockdale. From that time... All the way till his death in 2005, James Stockdale would tell you that it was that simple act of communicating that kept him going. 
It was that simple act of communicating that kept him going. That prayer is communicating with God. Prayer also enables us to communicate to, to, to others in, in ways that we can't on our own. That prayer is a, a disciplined dedication to paying attention. And it breaks the isolation, not just for, for prisoners 2,000 years ago, not just for prisoners in the Vietnam War, but prisoners in isolation today. I think we live in a time where isolation may be the greatest pandemic, far more than the virus. There are those that have, have shut themselves off, sometimes out of fear, sometimes out of resentment, and sometimes out of just not knowing what to do. You and I have power, power in the isolation to break the chains, to break the chains. This week, a beloved member of our church turned 100 years old. Doris Westbrook turned 100 years old. And this week, members of the church and some of her friends got in their cars. They, they, they couldn't go up to her, but we made a parade, a parade that went out of her neighborhood around into another neighborhood and all the way through another neighborhood. And, and during that parade, people had balloons tied to their cars, and, and she was out under the a covered drive through and, and they would roll down the window and, and wave to her, let her know that on her 100th birthday that we were thinking about her. I took her a large basket for, uh, full of cards <laughs> that were from members of the staff, members of the church, and when I gave it to her, she said, Tom, Tom, I want to be able to tell the people thank you. I said, Doris, you already have. That for her 100th birthday, People were communicating that she mattered to God and she mattered to us. Don't wait till someone's 100th birthday. You can do it today. And then in prayer, I tell you what I do. In prayer, I, I use that time to ask God, who is it you're calling me to communicate to, especially during this time? And and, and on Tuesdays and on Thursdays, I set aside uh, uh, names that, that, that maybe God gives me a nudge to write down. Or maybe he gives me a thump on the head to write down. And, and I give him a call or send him a text or write him a letter or shoot him an email to let folks know that they, they matter to God and that they matter to me too. You know, you can do the same thing. Let God use you. Let God use you to, to break the chains of isolation. There's a world out there that needs you. That needs you to break those chains. That needs the, the risen Christ as he, he lives through you to open those doors. The risen Christ as He lives through you to, to set that prisoner free. This morning, I want to invite you to let him use you. Pray with me. Jesus, we need this day because it's in this day, it's in this time that you use us, yes, to connect to you. In prayer, and that we began to access your incredible power Power enough to break the chains of fear. Power enough to break the chains of resentment. To break the, the chains of isolation. The isolation, not only of us, but the isolation of others. Use us, Lord. Use us. Because there's a world, world out there that is longing to know you. And the folks that you're speaking to this day, we're, well, you made us just the ones to tell them. 
Thank you for the opportunity. May we not let it pass us by. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life, and my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.